Thomas. Supervisor's got me working analysis today. God, I hate cutting these things open. Don't get me wrong, I'm not squeamish. I'm just worried about blowing up or something. I don't know about you, but that canary in a coal mine feeling has been getting a little too literal lately. Sometime in the future, the megacorporation Orpheus takes over a distant planet far out in the galaxy and begins mining. They discover some miracle resource known as Grimite, the strongest metal known to man thus far. Its full use and potential is unknown, and thus advertised as limitless by the company. The Grimite metal also doubles as currency for the inhabitants of the planet, and will serve as the main currency in-game. Naturally, transporting people this far out into space is expensive, so we're going to cut costs on labor and quality of life here, and now everyone's got to wear some sort of mask or gas mask. Very quickly, the planet devolves into two factions. The Orpheus Company and the Scavengers, or Scavenger, because we might be the only one that's running around this joint. That's right, this is your stereotypical evil corporation who's doing no good below the surface, and we're the only guy and it's our literal job to get to the bottom of it. We play as Scav, a young boy or girl who fucking knows, that has to rip and tear their way through guards, big and small, in order to take down the biggest mine on this planet, Zatabase 6. Our story starts in one of the many abandoned mining cranes outside Zatabase. Scav is taking a soldier's suit and helmet and heads down to the mines. Rather than go to his regular job of chipping away at rocks for precious grimite, he instead chips away at guards for their precious grimite. In fact, the more you beat up a guard as well as how efficiently and stylishly you beat them up results in more grimite out of them. So keep that combo meter going and you'll be rich in no time. Scav also takes some of the guard's armor for himself, increasing his health and swag. Wait a minute. A low poly game that takes place in a sci fi fantasy future on a mining planet that can't be the same planet as. We hit a snag. The only way down is to find a clearance level keycard that will allow our elevator to go down further. We sneak through the shadows, hell, not even the shadows sometimes. The mines are so dark that Scav can hide in any area that isn't well lit enough. Orpheus better start paying those energy bills or else this guy's gonna knock their lights out, metaphorically and literally. White man jump scare! Scav gets some huge upgrades and continues to pound some thugs in a platonic way. We finally find the keycard in the office of this floor. Through listening to the computers, playing transmissions, your disruptions aren't even mentioned on the base news. In fact, the workers are more worried about their boss visiting. Lucas, please make sure you get the security report in by 0400 this time. I don't want Krim's daughter breathing down my neck again. He's scary. Imagine killing dozens of heavily armed futuristic stun laser wielding guards, and you're nothing compared to the regional manager. I can only imagine how scared shitless these guys are when OSHA visits. Never mind, OSHA clearly doesn't exist in this universe. I can see why they fear their boss overlord so much. Using the keycard to get to the next floor, we're introduced to a new enemy. A more cyborg looking guard who is able to use equipment similar to ours. I hope this footage also shows you how scary of an enigma Scav is becoming. Shadows are becoming slimmer and slimmer, and the higher your stats are, enemies react helplessly towards you. Lower level guards genuinely act scared when Scav jumps out of the smallest crack in the walls to clap them. Scav lives in your walls and catches you for your precious metals. If you're carrying Grimite, he will find you. He's like a goddamn rape dwarf. I smell loot. The second floor relies heavily on taking out electronics to sneak by the well-lit areas. In fact, there's a large room in the middle of several guards where you have to take out one of the lights to sneak by. However, Mama didn't raise no bitch. So we use a stun laser to take out one of the lights. In their office, we're able to find another computer. This one with a recording of the reason Orpheus expanded their mining operations to this planet. So Grimite, which had only been found in weaker states on other planets, has found to be the strongest on Zatabase 6. Scav also finds a new piece of equipment, a teleportation grenade called the Tear Module. Originally created to move mined rocks and rubble with ease, not to mention it's far safer than dynamite for mining since if you're in the blast radius you just get teleported to a different room. This will work greatly to our benefit if we're fighting multiple enemies. Now we're fighting one enemy. And if there's way too many enemies, now we're not fighting any enemies at all. We dive deeper into Zatabase and find another computer. This one's stating that they've upped security and installed more cameras throughout the base for some reason. It looks like our efforts are finally starting to be noticed. Certain guards will have more frightened voice lines when getting into combat with you. The base has recognized Scav as an actual threat, but the upgraded security isn't just for you. It's implied through the computers that they're not just protecting Grimmite. On our way, we hear new dialogue from tougher guards. They're not afraid like the weaker ones and even refer to us as kid. 
dialogue such as, what are you doing here, kid, and hey, there's a kid here, keeps reminding us that we're just a silly little guy, a sneaky little turbo toddler, a very fragile kid. Wait, why is this kid doing this dangerous job? Who sent a kid from the faction to take down a mega corporation's mine? Questions for later. Look at this sick combo. Through flavor text on certain items as well as computers, we learn more about the planet we're on as well as the Orpheus company itself. Let's recap what we know so far. Our name is Scav, a kid with crazy close combat and infiltration skills sent by a faction looking to take down Orpheus for an unknown reason. Whether that's their unethical work practices or futuristic experiments or just revenge for something is unknown. The mining base that we're in is called Zatabase 6, implying that there's multiple mines on this planet since this is the 6th Zatabase. As for the planet itself, we find out from item text that it's called Mitric. So the reason Scav is here is to take down Orpheus, and the reason Orpheus is here is to mine the Grimite on this planet. Other details I picked up on is that guards don't use guns, one, because this is a mine, and canaries don't hang around coal mines for that very reason, but also because our armor, as well as the guards, is made of Grimite. Computers state that weapons are practically useless against people decked out in the thing. Melee weapons or gloves made of Grimite are essentially the best way of dealing with itself. Speaking of Grimite armor, we make it to the first boss battle. Trevor had been monitoring the entire time, and doesn't see us as a threat initially. His observations are true at first. We die 30 or so times trying to beat him, trekking our way through the same levels again and again and again back to Trevor. Not to break narration or anything, but I must mention this critique. This game, being a roguelike, kind of dampers the gameplay for me. Me love stealth, me love fighting games, but if I have the same stealth sections and the same fight with the same character over and over and over again, I'm going to get worn out pretty quick. Luckily, we beat the boss on our 40th try, and here's how I did it. Turns out spamming light attacks and learning to parry all of his attacks were the best way to beat him. I find it interesting that the head of security was rooting for us during the fight, against himself. What's so bad in these minds that he wants it all to end? He has cameras all over the place, so chances are that he's seen more than anyone else. It may have been annoying to train my way back to him 40 times, but we're going to help him out by getting to the bottom of this place. Zone 2 introduces water. It works similar to cameras in that if you're in them, you'll alert the closest guards. It also introduces a new enemy, the radar technician. He's capable of seeing a full 360 and can see into darkness. The only way to hide from him is to be behind solid cover. And when I mean solid, I mean something more than 5 feet thick. If Scav is a rape dwarf hiding in the walls, then the radar guard is the goddamn exterminator. He will find you, and he will evict you like a goddamn landlord, that bastard John. What he's guarding is another computer with some information about the planet and the plant life. Isaac, did you read the last report from Bio? It's insane, it just doesn't add up. Simply put, the Mitric cells are putting out too much power. Like, way, way too much. The ratio from math to power storage and output just dwarfs any form of energy we've been able to harness. Just one cell could power a small city for a year. Where are they getting all this power? So the lady from the previous recordings was correct. Grimite isn't the only thing Orpheus is protecting. The plant life on Mitric is capable of outputting electricity like a potato. Except a potato only outputs enough to turn a clock, whereas a metric blob can power an entire town for a year. It's basically nuclear. Speaking of which... What's up, Thomas? Supervisor's got me working analysis today. God, I hate cutting these things open. Don't get me wrong, I'm not squeamish. I'm just worried about blowing up or something. I don't know about you, but that canary in a coal mine feeling has been getting a little too literal lately. So this stuff is crazy unstable. It's making more and more sense why they use tear grenades over dynamite, and stun batons over guns. If anything strikes this stuff with enough force, it could blow this entire place to smithereens. So we now have an option to take down Orpheus. We just need something to set this off. The only problem is, there's no dynamite and there's no guns. Even though Orpheus is breaking workplace violations, they at least want to keep their operations up and running. 
The tear grenades and the lack of gunpowder isn't for our safety, it's for the safety of the product. Classic. On the third floor of the zone, we find the angriest computer message yet. God, God, Andrea, please, let me know when you're going on break. Archer is seriously starting to get on my nerves, and if I don't vent about it, I'm gonna weld this filter shut. Okay, first question, what was Orpheus thinking? Handing our delegate prototype to that tool? If that metric cell decides to go critical because he pushed it too far, don't expect me to go running for that kill switch. Someone in power was given a metric cell so that they could turn it into a weapon. Yeah, the stuff that's nuclear can power an entire town and, you know, shouldn't be around any weapons is about to be turned into one? Yeah, I'd totally be just as pissed off as this lady in the computer recording. It's such a stupid decision on management's part. It almost feels like I'm working a real job. You know, someone in a higher position than you is allowed to break the rules and in the end is just going to end up hurting everyone else in the workplace. The story is simple for this game, but the age-old tale of evil company has mismanagement and does something bad is so real. That's why it works. That's why this theme will be mediocre at worst and great if pulled off in a relatable way. Scav ventures to the next floor to find out who's been turning metric cells into weapons. And for us, it's our next boss fight. Pretty cool, right? They tell me this thing can power a fleet's worth of tear drives. And all that energy is pulsing through me. Let's see if it's enough. Unlike the Trevor boss fight, Archer can't be spammed by lights. We have to wait for him to attack and either dodge or parry. At this point, I died a dozen or so times and got fed up with starting from the beginning of the game just to backtrack and lose half an hour of progress again to the same boss. So it turns out, if you Alt F4, it saves your file and you can continue from the main menu. Guess who's abusing this? Note, I said you can't chain attacks against him, which means you can at least get one or two hits in before he starts dodging rapidly. This means if you hit him while he's near a wall or parry him while he's near a wall, you can turn him into a punching bag. Also, if you've been saving your stun lasers, you can spam them against him and that will also make him overheat. His second phase gives him the ability to teleport between attacks and gives him a laser that shoots across the arena. The distance he keeps paired with this teleportation makes him really hard to parry and stick against a wall. Spamming stun lasers or waiting for him to overheat is the way to go for this second phase. Glad that's over. Finally, we can move on to the third and final zone. It's no longer caves and mine shafts. We're in offices and laboratories. A new zone means a new mechanic and a new enemy. We have doors that only open for office personnel, meaning you have to sneak behind guards as they're moving to get through specific doors. Our new enemy is a taller guard that has a slightly different attack pattern. It may sound simple, but I'm glad the devs didn't take the age-old route of give the enemy more health than damage and call it a day. New attack patterns are definitely the way to go, and it's much appreciated. I just wish that there was more than one new enemy per zone. Back to the lore, we can find weapons with tear modules installed inside them. A computer message says the tear gun is a complete success at negating armor. The gun is designed to teleport past hard cover and land on anything soft on the other side. So if we're wearing a bulletproof vest, the projectile won't land inside the armor, it will teleport inside the wearer. The scientist on the computer states that small caliber rounds are in order, as heavy rounds aren't necessary. The bullet's already inside the target. One thing I've noticed more about this zone is that it's built like individual arenas. It embraces the take ground against the enemy by stealthily taking them out one by one, gaining ground in, in a greater war. It is incredibly satisfying to take out every enemy, one by one, on a floor and having the entire place to yourself at the end. The second to last computer recording sheds some light on where we got our suit. Hey Nate, I looked through the personnel archives like you suggested, and I noticed something weird. There's a discrepancy in the number of guards stationed at Catabase 6. We're one short. According to the database, there's one person who toured with us to Cryptus and doesn't appear on the directory. The weirdest thing, though, is that it looks like their file's been completely wiped and redacted. They just up and quit? How do they plan on getting back to Earth? And as for the suit we stole, it might belong to a high-ranking guard. That, or we were a guard from the get-go, who worked his way through the ranks. It's heavily implied Scav was a worker who traveled from Earth, which means did work for Orpheus at one point and may have risen through the ranks. It's also not impossible for a young person to reach high ranks, as we'll see later. The last computer message is of the Terror Scientist. He states that he's going insane from working in the depths of Zatabase for so long, and that he's beginning to hear voices as well as another heartbeat right next to him. The pulse matches his own. The scientist in the voice recording scampers away from the mic. 
Scav runs back to our elevator to find out what the hubbub is about. He takes the elevator to the third boss, the CEO of Orpheus Technologies. You made it. Have a seat. A woman, probably somewhere in her 20s, is leading this Orpheus technology. Meaning it's not impossible that Scav was once a high-ranking official too. Hell, Elizabeth even mentioned she knows who you are, meaning you and your skills were already on her radar. Who was Scav before he became a scavenger? Scav makes his way down to the very bottom of Zatabase 6, to find out why the Mitric cells are so powerful, what's so secret, that even surface level guards don't know about it. Why do guards hear pulses at floor 3? Our Metal Gear Solid Stealth and our Metal Gear Revengeance gameplay has suddenly turned into Metal Gear Survive, but this game is actually good? The game has never thrown this many low health enemies at you at once. Tearing through these fragile enemies with a single kick is super satisfying. The decision on the creators to go from a high octane stealth to a horror game successfully is impressive to say the least. What the hell? What the hell? What is this? What is this? What is this? How the planet is able to imitate our own form is unknown. Maybe it's a form of adaptation. Either way, we're able to see just how powerful Scav really is. Not just his moves, but also his stealth. This entire time I've been joking how he can hide in the slimmest of shadows, but this entire time, whenever we were hiding, we truly were invisible. It is impossible to see him sometimes. Either way, we beat our Shadow Master self in return. And return to the surface. Oh yeah, remember how I said metric cells are explosive? The game is good. That is if you're okay alt f 4ing right before you die to the boss and soft resetting every time. But legitimately, the game is good. And the story, well, wise man once said that lore better be done right or don't include it at all. And for what little raw metal had, I think it done it right. Besides, I wouldn't have covered it if it wasn't. Dig somewhere else. So hats off to the small handful of creatives that made this. And if those creatives are watching this right now, please take this base raw metal game and add all the shit you wanted to add. Make a raw metal 2 for fuck's sake. Hear, hear me out, hear me out. I've seen way too many indie studios try to make unique games for every one of their installments. Maybe because they were taught that way, maybe they were taught to just, you know, be, be unique for every game they make. But they don't realize the one they strike gold with, they should expand upon it. You have the base, you have the coding, you have the world building. Just add shit without breaking your base game. And, you know, fix the, the bosses and save system. Thank you for a great game. And for the viewers watching this, the game is well worth the 20 bucks. And if you don't think so, there's always a sale to come in the future. I wish you adieu as I vanish into the shadows once more. Consider liking and subscribing and I'll see you in the next story.